Hey everyone, welcome to Wildlife Inspired. I'm your host, Scott Keys, and today we're going to talk about workshops. What are they? Who are they for? And a couple of tips in here as well, right after this. From time to time, I'll put out some questions asking people, what would you like to see in these videos? And one of the responses I kept getting was, could you talk a little bit about workshops? What, what are they? Why do we use them? And what do we need to know about them before we sign up? And I thought, it's a really good topic, so I finally got around to making this one, and I wanted to cover it in the following way. I like to be pretty logical in my layout. So today we're going to talk about the whys. Who, who utilizes wildlife photography workshops? We're going to talk about cost, activity, learning, types of species. Uh, we're also going to talk about some of the things around the people hosting the workshops as well. And at the end, hang out to the end. I'll give you three really important tips if you're ever considering utilizing this service for your own. So basically, what is a workshop? It's just a client paying somebody, normally somebody with some expertise, in this case, a wildlife photographer, to show them an area, show them species, maybe take them on an adventure, um, or maybe to uh, deliver on some images. And I want to be very clear about this. Not everybody is wired for this uh, type of service. So for example, I consider myself a little bit more of an explorer. And I talked to a lot of people when I asked about workshops and do you have any input on them? A lot of people were like, it's a waste of time and money. Uh, I would rather do it my own. I don't need anybody's help. Um, <laughs> workshops are dumb. I got a lot of that. Uh, from other people, it was like, I've had great experiences. I love doing it. And it made me wonder, like, why do we take the workshops itself? So there's a couple of reasons. Why are we going to pay somebody to do what we, we might be able to do on our own? Uh, one of the biggest factors is time. For me to go to a new area of the country, especially, and invest time in learning the species and the locations and what's accessible and what's the terrain like, yeah, there's maps out there. And in my case, I'm a bird photographer. I can go on eBird. I don't really know it like I know my backyard. And my backyard meaning like Lehigh County, Monroe County, Carbon County, Pennsylvania. I, I know these counties like the back of my hand. I know every dirt road, every trail, how the light hits. I've been here for years. So as a service, I may pay somebody just to, just to save me the time and energy of exploration. I've gone out to Texas and Arizona and Utah. And, and having people with some knowledge of those areas has been immensely helpful. So time is a big consideration. Another part of workshops could be that the person is interested in actually learning. So you're using the workshop instructor almost like a teacher. Show me how to use settings. The light is getting low. The, the light's really direct. Or this species, how does it behave? So you might be paying not just for the expertise of locations, but the expertise of how to use the equipment. You may be a beginner just starting out. You may be switching from landscape to wildlife. There could be a hundred reasons why you want the, the expertise and you're willing to pay for it. But I think workshops have a very valuable place. I'm going to talk about this. I, I told you I'd break this into some sections. I want to share a personal story. I also want to let you know I'm going to do two parts of this. I have a personal experience from one side as a client. I also have a lot of experience as an instructor. So I'm going to share both of those experiences. I'm going to share the first one today. And in part two of this series, I'm going to talk a little bit about how a workshop runs from behind the scenes. A lot of interesting stuff happens when you're actually hosting a workshop. And I don't do a lot of these, by the way. I'll talk more about this in part two. Today, I want to keep it really to the consumer and the client and answer your question. So let me give you my experience as a client. Some workshops take place in controlled environments. Now, there's this term, and if you're European, you'll call it a hide. If you're American, you'll probably call it a blind. And it's a setup where you walk into and set up. It's, it's camouflaged, it's screened, it's covered. Sometimes it looks like a shed. Whatever the setup is, you're going to set up your gear inside, and you're going to be hidden from the nature. Generally speaking, that environment is fairly controlled. So meaning there's a water feature, often, almost always a water feature. Sometimes food, perches might be set up. Uh, one really interesting side note to this story, I did a, uh, a video and it talked about what is wildlife photography. Now, I have always considered blinds as wildlife photography, even if it was staged. So even if there's water put out, because the animals, as long as the animals are wild, coming in from the outside, nesting in the outside, only coming there to feed, drink, bathe, um, I always considered that wildlife photography. I was shocked at the number of people who said, if you manipulate the environment at all, so a blind is absolutely manipulating the environment, even though the creature is wild, it is no longer wildlife photography. And I thought, wow, man, if, we, if that was the standard for it, and, and the question was really, if you ran a wildlife photography, would you allow these images in? 
30% of people, 40% of people said absolutely not. It is no longer wildlife photography if there's any grooming of the habitat. So if there's any man-made, I'm not talking about man-made structures. I'm talking about just influencing. So food, bait, sound, any of those, no longer wildlife photography. That would eliminate, in photography contests, at least 50% of all entries. I guarantee it. So uh, just an interesting side note. Back to my personal experience. I sign up for this blind down in Texas. I, I had had a notion that I would not like this. But it's very hard to say you don't like something you've never tried. So I paid for it. Paid the service. It was a couple hours. I don't remember the cost. I'm going to say it was a couple hundred bucks. We'll talk about cost in a little bit. Um, and it was an enjoyable experience to the extent I got to see a lot of birds that I would not get. I got clean looks. But there was some downside to that. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that at the end, some of the downsides of wildlife photography. But one of the downsides was it just didn't feel natural to me. It, it, it took away the sense of exploration, kind of that hunter mentality that some photographers have where, you know, they're like searching out the thing. And so it took away a little bit of that. So while it did provide me very good looks at certain species that I probably would not have seen in the wild, in that controlled environment, there was benefit to it, but it did certainly take away from that part of the experience. Now, for this video, I'm talking about workshops. I live in the United States, but I, I'm not talking about safari. I, I think that goes into a whole nother category. Uh, I've got a friend that runs a safari. I'm gonna, I'm gonna drop them here. They get rave reviews off the beaten path. If you are interested in that, um, shoot them an email. Pricing for Safari, can, it can be a couple thousand. It can be tens of thousands. Very wide ranging. But hey, I'll put the website down at the bottom. Look them up. Shoot them an email. If you're interested in Safari, if that's how you got to this, uh, take a look at them. I'll, I'll give them a quick plug. Nothing here, by the way, sponsored. Any names that I mentioned, nobody's paid me for. They probably don't even know I'm mentioning them. I like to do this because I believe in those people or those services. You know, one of the things I didn't mention, and I, I meant to put it in when I talked about the blinds, is for those people that have the mentality that shooting from a blind isn't real photography, I will just challenge you back a little bit. It is a valuable service for people who are elderly and lack the mobility that I am gifted with um, to be able to shoot in locations and see birds that they can't shoot, that they can't do the things that I do. They can't hike up mountains. So having a blind um, photography service available, I do think has a very important value, especially for people that lack the means to do the things that some of us take for granted. So I wanted to mention that. Let's talk about some of the factors in wildlife workshops. The first one is cost. Cost is going to be all over the place. There's a solo cost, meaning one-on-one, -on -one, and there's often a group cost. As an instructor, the groups are obviously way more profitable. For a group setup, on a destination, not including airfare, not including lodging, not including hotel, you could be looking at somewhere in the neighborhood of $1,000 a day. Now, that is pretty wide ranging. I'm going to tell you that is a ballpark based off of my experience. I did do some research on, on photography workshops, what they were currently priced at. Not a real great average in here. So per day, I'm going to say 500, uh, go up to 2,000 a day when the location is more exotic and there's more involved. You do have to remember, some of these workshops involve travel, passes, um, other things, other expenses, but pretty wide ranging in terms of cost. For a solo workshop, now uh, pretend I wanna go see loons or I wanna go out west and I wanna shoot shorebirds uh, at the Great Salt Lake. I wanna go uh, to Pennsylvania and shoot songbirds. I wanna pay somebody one-on-one. -on -one. What's the hourly rate going to look like? Could be two to three, four hours probably looking at a rate between $50 and $150 an hour. For some people, that's going to be a little tough to swallow. You're like, $150 an hour, that, that's, that seems like a lot of money. Times four hours, that's $600 for half a day. I will tell you this, I, I literally just had a plumber here. He was here for half an hour. I got a bill for $140. Professional services are going to run you between $50 and $150, I would say minimum. For a well-known, uh, say famous photographer, in-demand photographer, it could be more than that. One-on-one, -on -one, it could easily be more than that. And that has nothing to do with travel and expense. That's just for the time. So know that up front. Another aspect to think about when booking these workshops is the level of activity. Some of these workshops, literally, you're going to pull up into, into a parking lot. You're going to tell you to set up a tripod. And you're going to shoot a, uh, a rookery right there from the parking lot. You're going to go shoot bald eagles right from the side of the road. Um, 
you may be shooting bear or elk right from your car. So a lot of it is going to be very low impact. And that's important to know based off of your physical activity. Um, but back to the level of activity, could be stationary, could be a lot of hiking. I mean, this could be five, six miles of hiking, could be backpacking. I know some photography workshops that you bring a tent and you camp. So really understand what that looks like. I'm going to talk more about this at the end when we're figuring out which the, what is the right workshop for me. Uh, another category, uh, when I asked people for feedback, they, a lot of people mentioned learning. One of the common comments was, I had hoped to learn more, but all I did was see subjects. So some guides, some workshop leaders are going to perform their job more as guides. In other words, I'm a local expert on habitat. I'm a local expert on species. Here's what we can expect to see. Here's where I'm going to take you. Some of them will even go so far as to shoot right alongside with you the whole time. I, I had a comment. My workshop leader was more interested in taking photos than of teaching. Understand what that, where the value is for you. If you're an experienced photographer who understands your camera, you may not be looking for the same level of learning. You actually may want a guide who is showing you things and getting you to places you don't know about, as opposed to somebody who's teaching you how to use your camera. For a newer photographer, your instructor may want to be much more of a teacher than a guide. Important to understand the distinction because a lot of workshops will offer um, differences when it comes to that. Two more things I want to talk about with workshops. There's a lot of details here, but I wanted to cover some of the basics. And I don't think this one should be understated. There's two here that I don't think should be understated. And one is personality. In an environment where, I hate to put it this way, but we are becoming very polarized. I think social media has a lot to do with that. News certainly has a lot to do with that. Polarization on a lot of topics. And it, it's not just political pol polarization. It's just polarization about a lot of stuff. Imagine spending two days with somebody who had a completely different mindset than you have. Now, if you're open to debate and they are, that could be fun. I love that, by the way. I love people who have opposing views and I love to challenge and debate. However, if I was with somebody who was set in their ways and wanted to preach about their beliefs for two days, I would have a really tough time with it. Maybe it was different 10 or 20 years ago. There are some, certainly a lot of people that are neutral, maybe apolitical, don't have strong opinions, can get along with everybody. That's great. But I will tell you, I've, I've heard of people who can have these very um, strong opinions and very vocal about them. And when you don't believe in that opinion and there's not a common respect, that can be really, really tough. So think about that. Who is this person? What is their personality? I had a, a guest on Lisa Langell, wonderful photographer, runs workshops. Check her out if you're interested in workshops, by the way. Never heard anything bad about this person. She made the comment with art. Very true of workshops. People aren't just buying the image that they see on the screen or the image that they see on the wall. They are buying the artist themselves. She made a comment that it's always easier to sell when you're there. So when you, when you can explain to people, tell the story, let them meet you, they want to take a piece of that home sometimes. And so that's very, very powerful. Workshops, not much different in that you may want to decide, you may want to make your selection based off of do you like this person? Do you respect this person? Do you like the work that they do? Is there, is there a level of, of respect and understanding there? So could be really, really important. So don't underestimate personality. Uh, again, even somebody who, who is very knowledgeable and knows the camera and knows the wildlife, if you, if you just can't stomach them for a long period of time, it, it could be a rough experience and you're paying for it. Last thing, had this comment come up quite a few times, ethics. This is a huge one. I'm going to make a couple of broad statements here. You're free to challenge me down in the comments. Broad statement. Both the person paying the client and the person running the workshop, oh, they are more likely to breach their ethics when in a group that is being paid for than when they're on their own. So if I'm under pressure, if somebody has paid me, and normally I would spend couple minutes trying to lure a bird, trying to attract a bird, trying to get a look at it. Wasn't happening. I, alone, I might leave. 
person paying me a couple hundred dollars wants to see that bird, I may go and do things that I wasn't uh, uh, normally, that I wouldn't normally do. That's one thing. There's uh, so much to talk about with ethics. Um, I may try to flush. I may try to move a subject that I wouldn't normally do. Like, hey, I'll be right back. I'm going to go scare this thing and get your shots. Do not think that doesn't happen. Again, I'll make the broad statement. I think more when money is involved, it's more likely or more likely to get unethical behavior. People are often very surprised at the ethics that happens at, at um, these workshops. I'll just put it out there. I didn't expect to see this. I didn't expect this to happen. More than one occasion, uh, people that were with me for various reasons, wildlife photographers have told me that they got up and left. So group of people, uh, this doesn't feel good. I'm going to take a break. You know, I'm going to check out. I'll be back later. And they did. I'll tell you a quick story and no names involved. By the way, down in the comments, you can share your stories. Please don't put names on the stories. If you know of an unethical photographer or workshop leader, I don't want to get into it on a personal level. Share the story anonymously, just as I do with all of these videos. Praise, mention a name. If you love a workshop, put it down there. I think people find it very, very valuable. Uh, use this as a resource. People searching out this video are probably looking at workshops. Put it down there because I do want it to be a benefit. Um, again, I do some small workshops, but I have very, very strict rules, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about those in part two of this. Quick story about ethics. Couldn't believe this one. I see this image on um, social media quite a bit. It's a bird species. I'll try to keep it as vague as possible. It's got this uh, bug hanging out of its mouth all the time. And I thought it was pretty cool. I actually thought this was the preferred diet of this species. A person, we were actually running a workshop. I was doing a workshop for somebody and they were, they were oh my gosh, I could tell you some stories. And I'm like, hey, it's a half hour drive to where we're going. Let's go. And they gave me some stories. And this one story they told I found fascinating. The bird that I had been seeing was um, probably the same bird. So people were taking this workshop over and over and they show up to the location. They're there to photograph this bird feeding. Wasn't really sure exactly what was going on. Person comes out and says, hang on, I'll be right back. Let me go get the stuff. The stuff meaning the, the, the bait. Um, <laughs> the workshop leader has them all get set up, lay down on the ground. We're going to do ground photography. That's going to be low angle. We're going to get some great images. Sun's here. Everything is it's like kind of stage. Um, person takes the thing, throws it out there, and here comes the bird. Bird just runs up. It's, it's, it's like feeding time. Knows exactly what time the, uh, the, the food is going to be there. Comes out, grabs the food, everybody gets a shot. And in my mind, I was seeing all these images thinking, this is what this thing eats. I bet you most of the images I saw were, they looked so similar. Was the same species, same person, same workshop. They did not expect that. Now, I, I don't know what the end of that story was, whether they stayed, whether they left. It, not, my, not my call on that one. But I will tell you, it was the element of surprise. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the people actually involved and, and what you should think about there. But before I do, some people are going to be interested in species. In other words, they're, they're paying to see a specific species. And I, I break this into two categories. One is the quantity and one is quality. So know where you're at on the spectrum and, and really understand what's to be expected. For some people, quantity is the expectation. I want to see as much as possible in as short a period of time. For others, they may be targeting specifics. And again, we're going to deal with some of the questions to ask after this, but they may be dealing with specific birds, uh, specific species, specific mammals, things that are a little bit harder to find and might require some expertise to locate. So with all that considered, with all of those factors considered, I'm going to leave you with three what I think are critical tips when it comes to booking a, a workshop. Number one is ask for referrals. And this will give you a real good idea of what you're paying for. Now, Anybody with a website is only going to put their best reviews up there. But find sources and don't be afraid to put the question out. Has anybody taken this workshop? Has anybody done this before? There are Facebook forums. There's birding groups. There are communities of photographers. There's social media. So there's a lot of ways to get information out of people. Don't be afraid to ask the community for referrals about that person. And then ask the questions during that referral process. The second thing, the second tip, set expectations. I can't, I can't express that enough. Create a goal and set expectations of what that should be. If I'm going to pay several hundred or several, several thousand dollars, what is my goal? Is my goal, we talked about some of this, is it to learn? Is it to see subjects? 
Is it to find locations? What am I trying to get? Because that is going to help you determine where to go. So I've created these goals. And then what is my expectation? Dealing with, again, the workshop itself, but also with the person. What is my expectation around who I'm getting with? The last tip, and this is probably the most important, communicate and ask questions. Keep in mind in this process, you are the client and you are the paying customer. It is absolutely within your bounds to ask questions. What can I expect? Where will we be going? What's the level of activity? Gr really uh, established workshops will probably communicate that some up front, but don't be afraid to ask some of those more challenging questions, particularly some of the sensitive questions when it comes to personality, guidelines, ethics. So a really critical piece of advice, Anybody who's afraid to answer those questions, I would tell you to consider whether or not it's the right person to be hosting your workshop. You are the paying client. You have the ability to ask the questions and you should know what you're getting into with any of these. So you ask for the referrals, you set the expectations and you create goals. And then most importantly, you communicate and you ask those questions. So hopefully you enjoyed the video on workshops today. I will remind you there's a subscribe button down at the bottom. Make sure you hit that and click that little bell for notifications. It'll let you know when I have a new video out. I really do appreciate your support of the channel. And I say it every time, I really do hope we can continue to find inspiration in wildlife together.